Hello, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be going over some recent library hauls, including some books which I got for the um, ongoing um, Historathon 2023 readathon. It's basically like going through the entire year booked into like major like categories, like periods of history. And the first is on um, prehistory through the year um, 500 of the Common Era. And I absolutely love, love, love prehistory. It's been a great fascination of mine since I was um, eight years old in the second grade. My um, favorite um, of our prehistoric um, cousins' ancestors are um, the Neanderthals. I absolutely love them so much. And I can recommend so many other awesome books to you guys about prehistory and Neanderthals in general in a separate video. But um, these are the three particular ones which I got, um, Lone Survivors, How We Came to Be the Only Humans on Earth, which is very similar to a book I read a few years ago called um, Last Eight Standing. This is by um, Chris Stringer. And he, just like, you know, someone after my own heart with the same, you know, great love of like, prehistory and our evolutionary biology and um, paleoanthropology in this. So this is the synopsis. In Lone Survivors, the world-renowned paleoanthropologist Chris Stringer puts forward a radical new theory of humanity's origin. Drawing on previously unavailable archaeological and genetic evidence, he argues that Homo sapiens did not originate in a single region of Africa. Instead, distant populations coexisted across the continent with other species like Homo erectus, exchanging genes, tools, and behavioral and survival strategies before some of them migrated into Europe and beyond. Eventually, Homo sapiens replaced all other human species for like reasons that are like very, very complicated. Stringer describes how advances in modern science have had a huge impact on our understanding of man's origin and how newly available analysis has shown that the appearance of modern humans was not inevitable, but was the result of successes, failures, luck, diet, and climatic changes. In Darwin's time, there was little fossil evidence at all, but today it is possible to map the genome of a Neanderthal and scan hominid fossils down to the width of a single cell. New techniques from radiocarbon dating to satellite images can unlock remarkable evolutionary insights from fossils, measure historic temperature fluctuations in Greenland ice, and discover huge river channels beneath the desert sand. In exploring the different aspects of the theory, Stringer addresses some of the most intriguing questions about mankind's past. What forces shape the origin of modern humans? What do the genetic data really tell us about our origins? What drove modern humans to migrate from Africa? How much of our modern behavior was shaped by earlier human species? Is the evolution of modern humans complete, and are we the finished product? Lone survivors is a definitive account of who and what we were, and will change perceptions about our origins and about what it means to be human. And as I said in some previous videos and on many um, blog posts of mine, like, you know, paleoanthropology, like, paleontology, like, you know, evolutionary biology, that's like what really, really dream career for me if you know life had gone differently I would absolutely have loved to have spent my life you know working in a museum or like paleogenetics it's just like such an absolute you know passion of mine and this is the second book which I got um first steps by Jeremy De Silva how walking upright made us human it's just like such a fascinating like rich subject I wish more people who like knew about this and were interested in it because like it kind of gives me chills thinking about our prehistoric ancestors you know they really weren't that much different from us they were they weren't just like oh distant fossils they were you know like our ancestors are like many many great grandparents and like so you know i love when like the anthropologists and paleontologists give them names like arty or to my particularly um to my um sahelanthropist um shadensis i believe the name is correct and seven million years ago his the name they gave him is to my which means um hope of life in that um particular african language it's just like kind of gives me goosebumps thinking because like this was you know our hope of life our ancient prehistoric ancestor is just like so so very like lovely and personal to me so here is the synopsis humans are the only mammal to walk on two rather than four legs a locomotion known as bipedalism we strive to be upstanding citizens to honor those who stand tall and proud and to take a stand against injustices we follow in one another's footsteps and celebrate a child beginning to walk but why and how exactly did we take our first steps and at what cost? Bipedalism has its drawbacks. Giving birth is more difficult and dangerous. Our running speed is much slower than that of other animals, and we suffer a variety of ailments and hernias of scoliosis. In First Steps, paleoanthropologist Jeremy De Silva explores how unusual and extraordinary this seemingly everyday ability is. A seven million year journey to the very origins of the human lineage, First Steps describes upright walking as a gateway to many of the other attributes that make us human. 
from our technological abilities to thirst for exploration to our use of language and how it may have laid the foundation for our species traits of compassion, empathy, and altruism. Moving from developmental psychology lab to ancient fossil sites throughout Africa and Eurasia, the silver brings life to our adventure walking on two legs, delving deeply into the story of our past. In the new discoveries rewriting our understanding of human evolution, first steps examined how walking upright helped us rise above all other species on this planet. So we really were, you know, the last eight standing. And this is the third book, which I got for the first leg of the Historathon Readathon, Lucy's Legacy, how the quest for human origins by Donald C. Johansson, or maybe it's Johansson, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it, with um, Kate Wong, and they also, or Donald um, Johansson also wrote um, Lucy, The Beginnings of Humankind, although um, in future I might get other books for the readathon, like prehistory, as well as like, you know, ancient history, because it does cover like until the year um, 500 um, CE, and I've also already begun um, reading this one, so. In his New York Times bestseller, Lucy, The Beginnings of Humankind, renowned paleoanthropologist, Donald Johansson told the incredible story of his discovery of a partial female skeleton that revolutionized the study of human origins. Lucy literally changed our understanding of our world and who we come from. Since the traumatic find in 1974, there has been heated debate and, most important, more groundbreaking discoveries that have further transformed our understanding of when and how humans evolved. In Lucy's legacy, Johansson takes readers on a fascinating tour of the last three decades of study most exciting period of paleoanthropologic investigation thus far. In that time, Johansson and his colleagues have uncovered a total of 363 specimens of Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy's species, a transitional creature between apes and humans, spanning 400,000 years. As a result, we now have a unique fossil record of one branch of our family tree, that family being humanity, a tree that is believed to date back a staggering 7 million years all the way back to our ancestor, um, Tuma, whose name, again, um, means hope of life, which is like so, so absolutely beautiful. Focusing on dramatic new fossil finds and breakthrough advances in DNA research, Johansson provides the latest answers that post-Lucy paleoanthropologists are trying to include questions such as, how did Homo sapiens evolve? When and where did our species originate? What separates hominids from the apes? What was the nature of Neanderthal and modern human encounters? What mysteries about human evolution remain to be solved? Donald Johansson is a passionate guide on an extraordinary journey from the ancient landscape of Hadar, Ethiopia, where Lucy was unearthed and where many other exciting fossil discoveries have since been made, to a seaside cave in South Africa that once sheltered early members of our own species and many other significant sites. 35 years after Lucy, Johansson continues to enthusiastically probe the origins of our species and what it means to be human. Now these are my other library halls, which I'm going to try to get through quickly. They're not related to the... Um, Historathon, but I just thought it would, you know, combine them all into one video. This is um, 100 Saturdays on Stella Levi and the Search for a Lost World by Michael Frank. Artwork by um, Myra Kalman or Myra Kalman. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mispronouncing her name. And I thought this was interesting because it's you know, like that um, Sephardic um, Jewry, like back in Greece. Many people are unfortunately they just only know about like Eastern and Central European um, Jewish history and communities if they know anything at all about you know our people but like this is like there was a whole wide where there is a whole wide world beyond like like russia poland like germany and france you know like you know just so many places around the world and it's just unfortunate many people have this like an ashkenazo centric attitude but so anyway here's the synopsis with nearly a century of life behind her stella levi has never had never before spoken in detail about her past then she met michael frank he came to her greenwich village apartment one saturday afternoon to ask her a question about the Kuderia, the neighborhood in Rhodes where she'd grown up in a Jewish community that had thrived there for half a millennium. Neither of them could have known this was the first of 100 Saturdays over the course of six years that they would spend in each other's company. During these meetings, Stella traveled back in time to conjure what it felt like to come of age on this luminous legendary island in the eastern Aegean, which the Italians began governing as an official possession in 1923, transformed over the next two decades. So the Germans seized control in September 1943. Following July, they rounded up all 1,650 residents of the Kuderia and sent them first by boat and then by train to Auschwitz on what was the longest journey, measured by both time and distance, of any of the deportations. Ninety percent of them were murdered upon arrival. Stella was born into the mysterious world of Jewish roads, witnessed its destruction, and lived to tell the tale. Probing and courageous, elegant and sly, she is a modern-day Shahar Razadi, whose stories reveal what it was like to be formed by an extraordinary place in an extraordinary time to construct a t life after that place had vanished. 
100 Saturdays is a portrait of one of the last survivors, drawn at nearly the last possible moment. It is also an account of a tender and transformative friendship that develops between storyteller and listener. They explore the fundamental mystery of what it means to collect, share, and interpret the deepest truths of the life deeply lived. I'm really looking forward to this. If I ever have enough clout and visibility and popularity on BookTube, I would love to host a readathon in May for um, Jewish American Heritage Month. Like, that probably won't happen for years if it happens at all, but, you know, you can dream anyway. And so this one I kind of already DNF'd it. I'm not really sure I'll get back to it. It was just, like, so boring. It didn't draw me in. It's, like, way more telling and showing than, like, oh, this happened, then that happened. Like, summary of a dialogue. Like, no real active scenes. It's just, like, kind of, like, boring. And I have, like, many thoughts about people who feel like historical fiction has to be about real people. And this, like, really, really disappointed me. But I've been told, like, his other books are good. And this is by, um, Colm Toibin Toibin. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. I'm not perfect at Irish pronunciation. The magician, which is um, about um, the novelist and Nobel Prize winner, Tomas Mann. And this is like from one of today's most brilliant and beloved novelists, a dazzling epic family saga set across a half century. It didn't really feel epic to me. It just felt, you know, kind of dull and detached, not really getting into like a deep perspective of anyone. It's just like, oh, this happened. Then that happened. I hate that trend. Like, so much in like historical writing these days i should do a whole other video about that um colm toibin's spectacular new novel opens in a provincial german city at the turn of the 20th century where a boy thomas mann grows up with a conservative father bound by propriety and a brazilian mother alluring and unpredictable young mann hides his artistic explorations from his father and his homosexual desires from everyone he is infatuated with the son of one of the richest most cultured jewish families in munchen and marries the daughter he and katya have six children in the novel Budenbrooks, he writes about his own family. On a holiday in Italy, he longs for a boy he sees on a beach and writes the novella Death in Venice. When Katya spends six months in a sanitarium, he writes The Magic Mountain. He is the most successful novelist of his time, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, a public man whose private life remains secret. He is expected to lead the condemnation of Hitler, whom he underestimates. His oldest daughter and son, leaders of bohemianism and of the anti-Nazi movement, share lovers. In 1933, the Mons flee Germany for Switzerland, France, and ultimately America, living first in Princeton, New Jersey, and then in Los Angeles. In a stunning marriage of research and imagination, Toibin explores the heart and mind of a writer whose gift is unparalleled, and whose life is riven by a need to belong and the anguish of illicit desire. The magician is an intimate, astonishingly complex portrait of Mann, his magnificent wife, Katya, and the times in which they lived. First World War, the rise of Hitler, World War II, the Civil War, the Cold War, and exile. This is a man and a family fiercely engaged by the world, profoundly flawed and forgettable, unforgettable. As People magazine said about the master, it's a delicate, mysterious process, this act of creation wrought with psychological tension. And Toivin captures it beautifully. And I've heard some people also complaining he has, um, Mon, why, I don't know if this like really happened or not. I hope it didn't happen. Like, you know, like feeling sexual desires for his own 13 year old son. Like that's freaking creepy. And if that didn't happen, you're like basically like slandering and, libeling someone who's no longer around to defend himself like a, a real person I, I hate when also when these people do like you know historical can't be like oh let's make this person gay without any evidence this really happened beyond like a couple of you know rumors but there's no like concrete proof but oh i just want to spice up the story and make this character seem more real for like the youngins these days like just write what the character actually did like if you should like invent things like things that make sense like for example in my alternative history i'm sorry if i'm getting off track like there's just you know in the middle ages there's not a lot of documentary evidence for anything a lot of these people did beyond the major players so you basically have like a lot of leeway to play around and like say oh maybe this person was like this and so you can like go off on a whole like direction of because like all you know is this basically this person exists this is who this person like married like the family etc like that but when these are per people like well within the purview of like documented modern history you have like a lot stronger like you know, commitment to, like, do only what absolutely happened instead of, like, using a lot of imagination and creative license because we just, like, don't know. This is, like, uh, so inexcusable if he really, you know, didn't, like, feel that way about his son. It's just, like, creepy. I'm almost unfinished with this book. I'm hoping to do a video about it. I'm um, The Man Who Hated Women by Amy Son. I'm um, Sex, Censorship, and Civil Liberties in the Golden Age. It's about um, Anthony Comstock. Some of you might know about that. Comstock Act, the Comstock laws, the Comstock um, laws. I'm sorry, this was like in the late, middle, and 19th century until the early 20th century. It was kind of like the post office version of the the Hayes Code in films from the the early the 1934 until like I get the night 1960s. They were finally like permanently swept away completely. But it was, it was, he was like such a 
neo puritan he hated women it was like oh not even doctors or like professional serious sexologists can send you know informative educational books through the mail about like birth control for like married couples or teaching you know like engaged couples or married couples how to have like better more fulfilling sex without like like porn no pornographic content it's just like basically like medical and scientific like respectful of the relationship just like he was like such a horrible person and some of the women he was you know hounding they committed suicide because he was just like such a horrible like horrible person they were like afraid oh i can't really go to court this would be horrible for me i'd have to go to like you know the workhouse or whatever or women's prison and suffered just he was a horrible 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 person just oh what a absolutely horrible person there were a few uh, men involved as well and they obviously their families did suffer if they had to go to jail because you know women couldn't work in those days and that just was like it's it, i just can't say enough about how much i absolutely hate anthony comstock i'm so glad those laws were finally swept away like the last vestiges in the 1965 just like what an absolutely horrible horrible person well, this is one i'm also reading i'd heard um, a lot of the you know controversy about it when it came out i believe in 2017 to siri with love by judith newman a lot of people in the so-called neurodiversity community which i have many opinions about i absolutely slaughter this book and i can kind of see like there are definitely some really like inexcusable effed up things she says in this book like oh i don't want my son who was only 13 at the time to have children like i hear the benny hill soundtrack whenever i picture him in a sexual situation that doesn't end well so when he turns 18 i'm going to get power of attorney so i can give him a vasectomy and make sure he never procreates like seriously and she uses a r word to talk about a girl like a special needs girl who was bullied at her school when she was young she's like oh why couldn't your parents like spend beyond their means and send you to like the special private school in a tony suburb so the r word girl wouldn't be bullied by the like the nice white and delightsome girls or whatever she's saying about her and there's just other things like she's thinking like oh i have to look at my son's my 13 year old son's like porn or internet history because oh it's not normal for a 13 year old to not look at porn all the time and like she's telling her neurotypical son like oh prostitution is a rewarding career for some women and you shouldn't even call them prostitutes you should call them sex workers which oh as a second wave radical feminist i'm 100 percent against like pornography and prostitution but obviously that's a subject for another thing but like many many like actual autistics and um asperger's people they really really are against this book and i can kind of like you know see both sides like she says wonderful things about her son many times obviously she's not autistic herself so she can't really like understand fully but you can tell like she's trying to like be sympathetic and understand like you know halfway there to getting there but you know just a different completely perspective and people were like expecting oh this would be a raw 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 like you know do whatever you want all the time this isn't a disability at all this shouldn't be difficult at all she should just like lovingly accept it and not have any struggles with you know, like coming to terms that her autistic son it just won't be like other people his age like maybe ever and so obviously maybe i could do a whole separate video on this book and i just um got this one out of the library i frequently ask questions about the universe it looked um really really cool by jorge chom and daniel whiteson authors of we have no idea and like you know it says you've got questions about space time gravity and the odds of meeting your older self inside a wormhole all the answers you need are right here and like just really really cute things about like oh where did the universe come from are humans predictable is an asteroid going to hit earth and kill us all what's stopping us from traveling to the stars is there another earth out there why can't we teleport i heard it might be possible after the year um 2100 if it happens at all for like humans being teleported and what happens if i get sucked into a black hole like how long will humanity survive is there another you like why haven't aliens visit us or have they this is like really fun and cute i'm looking forward to this and also this um caught my eye father lincoln i've been really really interested in the lincoln since i was like eight years old that's obviously another story for another video as well but you know he was like one of my favorite he still is one of my favorite presidents but i like read a lot about him when i was younger like sometimes you know kind of like waves and waxes over the years but it's like never like completely left me i still absolutely love reading about him and, and one of my particular interests for a long time has been his sons particularly the two youngest i'm um, tad and willie who are like you know perhaps the best known because they were like children when he was in the white house and like that oh they're such cute little boys and they're so like precocious and everyone's like writing about them and photographing them and so obviously this is basically just his relationship with his children and i guess he and his um, wife um mary todd lincoln were kind of like attachment parent parents before it had a name like you know back then people like oh just beat the hell out of your kids all the time they don't even have feelings or rights like oh if they step out of line and do something that's not 100 percent perfect oh it's time for the woodshed and like give them a whooping but you know it's just he had like a 
much more like modern like understanding of being like a good parent and if i am blessed with children before um, time runs out um god willing i hope to be the very similar type of parent like that and this also the daughter of auschwitz um, my story of resilience survival and hope by hilda friedman and malcolm brabant and forward by sir ben kingsley and she's a, a very well obviously she's not young now but she w was like very young at the time like most um show of survivors had to be, you know, like at least like, you know, 12 or 13 if they were in a concentration camp, unless like there were obviously some extraordinary circumstances, but usually like 12 or 13 was the youngest most but she was like a young child in Auschwitz, which is like absolutely um, extraordinary. And here's the synopsis. Hilda Friedman was one of the youngest people to emerge from Auschwitz. After surviving the liquidation of the Jewish ghetto in central Poland, where she lives as, lived as a toddler, Tova was four when she and her parents were sent to a Nazi labor camp. She was almost six when she and her mother were forced into a packed cattle truck and sent to Auschwitz II, also known as the, known as the Birkenau extermination camp, while her father was transported to Dachau. During six months of incarceration in Birkenau, Tova witnessed atrocities that she could never forget and experienced numerous escapes from death. She was one of a handful of Jews to have entered a gas chamber and lived to tell the tale. As Nazi killing squads were in Birkenau before abandoning the camp in January 1945, Tova and her mother hid among corpses. After being liberated by the Russians, they made their way back to their hometown in Poland. Eventually, Tova's father tracked them down and the family was reunited. In The Daughter of Auschwitz, Tova immortalizes what she saw to keep the story of the Holocaust, the Shoah, alive at a time when it's in danger of fading from memory. She has used those memories that have shaped her life to honor the victims. Written with award-winning former war reporter Malcolm Brabant, this is an extremely important book. Brabant's meticulous research has helped Tova recall her experiences in searing detail. Together, they have painstakingly recreated Tova's extraordinary story about the world's worst ever crime. And as I've, I've said in some previous videos, after I make Aliyah a move to Israel, I'm hoping to get a master's degree in Holocaust um, studies and history at the University of Haifa in their um, international program, which means it's um, taught in English because my Hebrew isn't ne nearly strong enough to take a full like program in anything and like exclusively Hebrew. And so that's like, I really would like to, you know, work in like a museum or a library or an archive about the Holocaust. I know that sounds like really like depressing and macabre and stuff, but you know, just something I have like read so much about over the years and I have such a great wealth of knowledge and I just feel that would be like something that would be absolutely wonderful, wonderful, um, perfect, um, fitting career for me. And hopefully I could maybe make a difference in the lives of, you know, children and young people coming to these like places, because unfortunately we're coming close to a time when there are no more survivors left. And this is, um, one of the final books, um, even after all this time, which like really looked um, interesting to me when I was um, browsing the um, biography stacks at the library, Story of Love, Revolution, and Leaving Iran by Afshina Latifi. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name. It's like also like a really um weird um typeface to render the name. And so this is um, a sign up some day um escape the Iranian revolution. In February 1979, when Afshina Latifi was just 10 years old, her father, a colonel under the Shah of Iran, was imprisoned by Khomeini soldiers. Afshina and her three siblings were left in the care of their mother, who did everything in her power to free her husband from jail and who struggled to survive in a newly fundamentalist society that was openly hostile to women. In the torturous weeks and months that followed, Mrs. Latifi and her husband communicated by writing notes to each other on tiny squares of paper and bribing the guards to pass them back and forth. Mami June Azizam Gorbanat, Colonel Latifi wrote in one of them, my beloved for whom I would give my life, please take care of the children. Do not worry about me. I am well. The situation continued to deteriorate, however. Both in and out of prison, Mrs. Latifi was verbally abused whenever she showed her uncovered head. Armed guards took to following her and the children everywhere, even to school. Determined men arrived in the middle of the night to search the house. In late May, Colonel Latifi was executed, shot with little fanfare on a prison rooftop. And the story begins. Fearing for the safety of her daughters, Mrs. Latifi made a heartrending decision. She sent off Shina and her sister, off Sane, abroad, knowing it might be years before she embraced them again, if ever. Even after all this time is an immigrant saga unlike any other. It is the story of a self-made man and a school teacher with whom he fell in love, of a family torn apart by war and violence, and of the two little girls who found themselves on their own in America, forced to become strong young women before they even had a childhood. It is also a testament to a mother and father who taught their children the true meaning of love, courage, and honor, and who gave them the inner strength they needed to achieve their dreams. And this is a little bit um, personal to me. Obviously, I'm not um, Iranian myself. I don't have any um, Persian heritage that I know of, but when I was um, growing up in the 80s and early 90s, my family was very close friends with an Iranian immigrant family who had also escaped from the revolution. I'm, I'm currently now um, friends. I connect reconnected with um, the boy who was my age on Facebook. His um, sister was a little younger than I was also, was also um, very, very good friends with 
her, but you know, like this is like something personal because we like celebrated Iranian like and Muslim holidays with them. And so it's just like, I grew up like loving their culture and being very familiar with. And that's one of many reasons because like, you know, I grew up in Albany, New York, which is like a very big Muslim population. So it never occurred to me to think, oh, all Muslims are evil and I should be afraid of them because like, I just like grew up knowing them as my like friends and classmates and neighbors. And this is the final book, which I got on the rabbi's cat by um joanne spar which is like i'm a, a graphic novel it's like a star story i believe it's on based on a folktale i'm like here are some of the illustrations obviously i i absolutely you know love cats and um jewish history just like and i really really appreciate um graphic novels i discovered them in my um young adult um, literature class which i took in on um, the autumn of 20 11 and this is um based in algeria in the 1930s so again many people falsely believe jews are have only lived in like central and eastern and western europe but no like we've been you know all over the world like particularly like most um israelis now i feel 80 percent are descended from people who were um kicked out of um swana like southwest um asia and north africa and the middle east because of the um, ethnic cleansing of 850,000 um jews after the recreation of the state of israel in 19. 19- 48 and so this is just like you know from algeria which like had a huge jewish community i could like maybe do a whole other video like the populations of these places like the jewish population just like shrank to almost nothing with like a couple of notable exceptions after all the horrible ethnic cleansing but anyway i'm really looking i'm forward to i'm going through the story particularly because of cats and jewish history and all that other stuff thank you very much for listening please if you've not already um please um consider subscribing i really really do like um see comments because it makes me help me give motivation to go forward and like feel like I'm becoming actual friends with people and my last two videos haven't had any comments which makes me feel like I kind of like wasted my time doing those videos so like really really would help me to get my you know spirits up and like feel like an actual part of this um booktube and author tube community if I you know start seeing like a lot of more regular comments and if you haven't um hit the notification bell so you can uh, know when I upload new videos and I will see you guys again very soon thanks for watching bye